starting right now uh, so that I can uh, post it and uh, any of the students can uh, see, uh, see it later on. So let me begin uh, to share my screen. Actually, no, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let me begin to share huh? my screen. I have class so right now. You can see uh, what I'm seeing and what I'm going to be uh, talking about. So I don't know if you realize what you got yourself into uh, when you sign up for plant propagation. Uh, but it is one of the most important uh, things that you can do. And you have joined uh, a elite group of uh, people that have, through their work for many, many years, have gotten uh, us where we are. So the first thing that I always like and ask people to think about is think about what you are eating. Uh, think about what you are eating because most of the things that you eat and most of the things that you or keep you alive and keep people alive are not what we refer to as new crops. All of those plants have been discovered or were discovered, were domesticated uh, over 4,000 years. And in the same manner, uh, the methods and the techniques that we are using for plant propagation, for plant propagating plants, are also very old. Yes, we have new technology. Yes, we have new chemicals or things that can enhance and improve uh, our success. But at the end of the day, the techniques were discovered also many, many years ago. So, and also think about uh, the history of uh, people. I always like to say that medicine is very, very, very important. I understand that. But the history of medicine is the history of plant domestication and eventually plant propagation, which in turn turns out to be the history of people. Because medicine was very important in the old days the person that knew which plants would cure whatever ailment was happening were the most important and the most valuable uh, medicine, medical doctor or medical medicine men or uh, witch doctor, however they are referred to in different cultures. Uh, and uh, the history of plant cultivation, propagation, multiplication, and food is the history of people. So we are all dependent on that. So think about the work that started many, many, many years ago as people started finding new areas and started moving away into other parts of the world that were unknown, people were very good at always finding what to eat. Now, this is where I wish I could have a magic mirror that I could just see perhaps events into the past where somebody who was the first brave or stupid person that tasted this plant. How many people died, gave their lives, uh, eating something that was poisonous before somebody realized how to process it and make it safe for everybody to eat and in turn feed the world. So think about that. So nothing that you're eating right now is going to be a new crop. Nothing that is feeding the world, uh, populations throughout uh, uh, the world is new. All of those are quite old. And so when we are looking at what ha had to happen for us to be able to eat today, uh, it had to be uh, agriculture. Uh, we know that was very important and that was one of the early developments in plants. Uh, and when people started to do agriculture, uh, and finding plants, there was several things that had to happen. Uh, the first one that you can see there is plant selections. Which plants can I eat? Which plants are toxic? I don't know. Uh, experimenting, probably. Did it kill people? Most likely. Did the stronger survive? Maybe. Did they all kill that were killed? Mm, perhaps entire civilizations. We don't know. But at some point, people found the plants that they were safe uh, for them. And so eventually they started selecting the ones that were tasting better to humans. They were maybe a little bit sweeter, 
uh, and or perhaps as time went by, they had a little bit more vitamins and minerals, more calories, uh, and then that became the stock for the modern day plants. So once they found that plant, they also had to have understanding as to how to propagate it. How do I get this single melon to give me a thousand more next year? So they had to understand something with the seasons. They have to understand that if you take a seed and put it in the ground, eventually you get a new melon plant and voila, you can harvest them when they're very close to you. How did it happen? We, we don't know. Uh, did it happen by them watching animals uh, eating the seeds and then pooping them and then something grew? We don't know. I wish I had that magic mirror into the past. So once you figure out how to propagate plants, whether through seeds, whether through cuttings, whether through grafting, then you have to produce the crop. How are you gonna now make uh, bundles and bundles and bundles of wheat so that you can begin to feed the entire village? So you're gonna have to produce the crop. You're also gonna have to uh, have a knowledge of the timing and ripening and when it's at its best uh, and also uh, when you have a lot of crops, how are you going to handle them? So handling and storing them, silos, this is the beginning of the silos where we're going to put the grain and save it for the future. Uh, also, uh, the saving of some of the better seeds uh, that we can plant in the future because those are going to give us a better chance and better crops and better yields in the future. Uh, so they had to figure, how do I make sure that this uh, food that I'm harvesting uh, doesn't rot and it's going to last me, uh, for, uh, last us for the rest of the year and uh, the rest of the winter until uh, we get to plant some more. And then food technology, how do you even process it? Not every plant uh, can be just eaten, chewed by people because some of them are not going to be digestible by us. We have to figure out how to prepare them, how to prepare them, how to make them taste decent or at least palatable so that we can get the vitamins and the minerals and uh, the amino acids and everything that we need to, uh, that we need for surviving. So this would be the grinding of the wheat uh, and the cooking of the food, uh, as well as the discovery of some of the seasoning to make things taste better. So those are the steps that many of the plants uh, uh, had to take or people had to take in order for uh, them to acquire the modern day crops that we have right now. So we know, and perhaps this is just a theory, that it may have started uh, by accident. So when a person, when a per, uh, people, a group of people would set uh, a tent or a camp in an area, their action of walking around a specific area for several times it's already going to compact the soil a little. Uh, it's going to already change the nature of the soil that is going to make it different. Now, in the past, they were not thinking about cleanliness, so they would probably also just uh, spit out whatever seed from whatever plant they managed to bring back. And so perhaps without them realizing, they have changed the soil and they were throwing seeds. Maybe one of them survived, but that was already a selection pressure for that one seed. And so that seed that survived around them, they discovered that now I don't have to go up the mountain to find a melon, I can just harvest it here. Uh, oh, and then that began the, probably the process of them tilling and working the soil to make it suitable for the cultivated plants. So again, it could have been just an accident uh, where people just by their sheer action of being around and moving uh, we're already pre-selecting or selecting the plants without them realizing it. So <clears throat> that would be in the hunters and gathering where they would just bring everything back and uh, eventually that led to agriculture, uh, which we know that agriculture started in many areas of the world. Uh, they're saying independently and there's other research uh, that has been done, discoveries that maybe people were communicating and moving a lot earlier than what they think. Maybe some information went from one area to the other. But at least when a, a group of people move into a different area, they were dealing with brand new plants, plants that they did not know. And so they had to find the ones that were 
edible and they were going to be safe for them to eat. So we have uh, where they think uh, the different uh, agricultures uh, or where agriculture uh, started in different parts of the world. And then we have the different types of plants uh, that were domesticated from different areas. Uh, understand that most of what you are eating is probably not from the Americas other than the corn and a few other plants uh, that were domesticated in America. Most of what you, uh, you were eating, the bread, the wheat, uh, most of the calories, even your fruits and vegetables are probably European or from Asia uh, because people tend to eat things that they know. Uh, so we have just an assortment uh, of uh, a list of different plants uh, that uh, originated in certain uh, parts of the world. So we'll get to see some of them. Uh, we get to see how they uh, change uh, and help uh, people along. Uh, one thing that is known is that people relied on what is known as a legume or a type of bean. Uh, the beans do have a lot of vitamins, they have a lot of minerals, they have a lot of protein. So uh, the one plant that is gonna provide that would be a legume and the calories will come from a specific grain. Uh, for Europe is gonna be wheat uh, and before wheat, uh, it was rye grass. They hear that rye was cultivated and domesticated way before wheat was. Uh, so lentils, lentils are very old in cultivation, probably one of the earliest uh, beans to be cultivated. You still find them as a good source of vitamins and minerals and uh, protein, uh, more diverse in uh, the Middle East and in Europe, and also chickpeas or uh, garbanzos. Uh, most people will tend to simply boil them, so you get them when they are nice and green. <clears throat> you can just boil them with salt and you have something that is very good to eat. Now over time uh, and as people started to select more plants, they started to select plants that would be giving them a bigger yield. So an increase in yield is a consequence of uh, domestication and also an increase in size of the seeds and also an increase uh, in uh, vitamins and minerals. Uh, so there is just plain garbanzo when they're green. Uh, when they're green, they provide a good uh, uh, food for people. And uh, when you dry them out for later time, then you can just roast them, grind them up and mix them with a couple of seasonings. And you got something very simple known as hummus. Uh, hummus that was also a very important easy way of preparing very good, good food for people. Uh, so those two things, either just plain simple salt and water or through the more complicated uh, process of hummus, you have lots of vitamins and minerals. Uh, in Italy or France, you have uh, fava beans. Uh, now fava beans are really bitter and in many plants, uh, bitterness is a common thing with uh, wild individuals. Now, as people have selected them, they have taken away the bitterness uh, out of the plant. And so, or they have learned to appreciate uh, the bitterness. Uh, we know that fava beans are great. We know that people who have a descent uh, from Europe, Italy, may be allergic to them because they were eaten so much by the Italian and the European culture that they developed some kind of an allergic reaction to them. Uh, so if you never had them, be very careful if you have any kind of ancestry uh, from that area. And that had to do because there was not, not too many other things to eat. And so they were forced to eat this or they liked to eat them. Uh, and then we have the peas. Uh, the peas that could also be stored for when they're dry or they can also be eaten uh, when they are green and uh, sweet. Uh, and then we have wheat. Uh, again, I wish I had that window into the past. Uh, it is believed uh, that wheat started as a weed, uh, an unwanted plant uh, before wheat was even found, 
people were already harvesting and growing rye grass uh, or rye grain. So people tilled the land, they planted a rye, and that was the choice grain. So how did wheat became so popular? Uh, as people tilled the land and they started growing rye uh, close in closer proximity to wheat, perhaps some of the seeds from the wheat landed on the field and they grew. Uh, it is a very common costume, custom to allow the people from the village to harvest anything that is left over after the main uh, crop is being harvested. So perhaps some person went after they harvested, saw this different plants that were left over, uh, harvest them, process them and realize that it was way better tasting than rye uh, grains. Uh, from there, maybe they, he, he or she started, uh, they started growing them. Uh, and then maybe they eventually share them with the rest of the village until wheat became the preferred grain. And now it is the grain that is mostly grown throughout the world. So wheat keeps millions and millions of people alive every single day. Uh, but that's just half of the problem. So when you have wheat, you cannot eat it and you can boil it with salt, but that's not that good. How, when, where did the process of making bread start? Who took a, a wheat kernel, ground it up, mix it with water, make this mush, and then how, who thought about putting it in an oven or was it an accident that somebody dropped it by a fire on top of a rock and then uh, it kind of baked? And then eventually they decided, oh, this is way better. We're going to call it bread. We don't know. Uh, we know that wheat was uh, sustaining the people. And if you're going to sacrifice it like that, you better be uh, willing to starve if you failed. Uh, but we have some of the earliest bread, which are the naan bread, the pita bread, uh, the crispy breads that uh, you find in the European cultures, which is nothing more than flour mixed with water and a little bit of spices like uh, dill or fennel. And voila, you have a very simple bread, flat bread, that you can now mix it with a little bit of hummus and you have something that is gonna give you lots of calories and vitamins and minerals. But who was the first person to come up with this? I wish I knew. Out of Africa, we have uh, the different types of melons, like watermelons. Uh, melons are going to be bitter in nature. Uh, watermelons uh, were a lot smaller than wild watermelons. They're very small. Uh, the big ones that we have in the markets are all selections for sizes. They're also not as sweet so the sweetness was added later on as a selection process. Uh, so big watermelons, that is all a human, uh, of human consequence. And uh, our honeydew melons, our cantaloupe melons, they're all uh, the same. Perhaps in the beginning, they were not harvesting uh, the melons for the meat. Perhaps they were harvesting for the seeds. Uh, we know that the seeds are edible. We know that the seeds have a lot of vitamins, minerals, and a lot more calories. Uh, so maybe somebody harvested a melon for the seeds. Maybe by mistake, they took a bite of the flesh and like, oh, this is now palatable. Maybe I should grow the seeds. And as time went by, it became sweet. We don't know. Uh, grapes. Uh, from Europe primarily, uh, that's, that's where a lot of the cultivated grapes are gonna be coming from. Uh, I'm sure, yes, it's a fruit that you can eat, obviously not as big as the ones we have right now. Uh, and then who came up with raisins where you allow them to dry out? When you're hungry, you might not eat them all. Uh, or did somebody just forget to harvest a bundle and came back later and saw them dry? It's like, oh, this is now good but that extended the shelf life. And so now you have a product that you can store for several years without having to go to waste or rot. And that way you also don't uh, need to eat everything right now. Uh, so grapes, uh, very important. Uh, and then grape leaves, 
who was the first person? Like, oh, let me put something, uh, stuff this grape leaf with uh, something else and let me eat it. Let's see how good is it going to be. Uh, we, I don't know. Uh, and then the process of making wine. How did that even come into play? So you're going to harvest a bunch of grapes that are really good, that are going to be feeding your village. And all of a sudden, you're going to step all over them, smoosh them, put the juice in a barrel, let it ferment. Fermentation was probably not known. They didn't really know what happened. And then uh, in a couple of months, drink it after it's gone to somebody's food. And it's like, oh, this is really good. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but we know that when was this wine was discovered a very long time ago. Uh, was it more of uh, the fact that water, they did not understand maybe polluted water or water that was not good for drinking and drinking I, uh, wine was better? I know that in Europe, that's why they like beer because it was safer to drink than uh, water. Uh, but the whole process of just who was the first person to create wine, we don't know. Olives, olives are horrible. They're disgusting. They have a lot of tannins. If you take an olive uh, fresh out of the tree, it's really, really bad. So who was so hungry that they decided to add a bunch of salt water and eventually remove or leach out uh, some of those tannins to make it palatable. So we still have some of the brown, dark olives that are still kind of bitter and they still have some kind of like, strong flavor, but people have learned to like them. Uh, eventually now we have selected some of the greener forms that uh, do not have as high uh, of uh, tannins as others and they are much better tasting or the process or some of the processes for removing the tannins of uh, the tannins from olives uh, they can uh, uh, they couldn't tell some uh, harsh chemicals so be very careful uh, but if you never had an olive in the past or before a fresh olive try it because it's it's quite good uh, <laughs> that was a joke, they're horrible. Uh, and almonds, uh, who was the person, the first person to find almonds? Uh, most of the family in this group have a lot of uh, cyanide. So if you ever bitten into the seed of a peach, it is disgusting, uh, it is toxic. Uh, but there's almonds that do not have any of those uh, compounds. So who was the first person to find that almond tree wherever they were exploring, take this fruit, eat it, and they found out that it was very good. And then hopefully take it back and plant it and grow some more. Uh, in the beginning, they were probably just harvesting some of uh, the green almonds, as you still may see uh, with people from the Middle East. Uh, so these are green almonds before the shell becomes hard and the interior becomes hard and they eat them with salt. So they could then uh, get some calories and then uh, as the uh, almonds mature, then later on they can harvest the seeds, store them for a longer period of time and have food for longer periods uh, of the year. So uh, almonds probably in the beginning were eaten as a fresh young uh, fruit. Uh, and uh, eventually, like I said, you get the almonds where this, uh, Outside is no longer good, but now you can remove the seed, which is sweet and has a lot of calories. Uh, and dates. Uh, we know that dates are referred to as the tree of life because they were valuable. Uh, they grow out of North Africa. They grow in uh, the desert, in the oasis. And so as people started to migrate out of Africa, they found the oasis, they found the dates. Uh, the dates that were uh, in the oasis were not as good. And most of the dates that you see in the landscapes uh, are very astringent and not as good or flavorful as the selections that you get from the store. Uh, but dates, when they're dry, they have a lot of sugar compared to other plants of the time. And uh, they're very light, so you could uh, restock, carry a bunch of them until you reach the next oasis and be able to do this, repeat the process. And that is with the aid of uh, the date palm, 
uh, the humans were believed to be able to go out of Africa and into Europe and eventually into Asia. Uh, so the dates, who started to harvest them? Who started to select them? We know there's magnificent selections in uh, Israel and in Turkey, uh, way better than what we get here in California. And coffee. I, I, I don't believe the story about a farmer seeing goats eat uh, the coffee and they were just uh, jumping around and uh, all of a sudden he decided to try it and voila. Uh, no, uh, I wish I had the magic mirror to find uh, who was the first person to uh, harvest coffee. We know that the cherry has a little bit of meat and it's sweet. Uh, it has happened before where other plants were eaten for the flesh and the seed was probably chuck. Uh, maybe at some point somebody spat out the seed next to fire and it kind of got roasted. And uh, maybe eventually somebody decided to grind it up and make coffee and make a drink out of it. Uh, we know that coffee originates in Africa. However, it is after uh, the, uh, the Arabs uh, got, got a hold of it that developed the process of making the coffee drink as we drink it now. So that is an Arab invention. And when you still go into some of the Lebanese or Middle Eastern uh, restaurants, uh, you can get more of the traditional coffee, which is like a shot with uh, some spices. Uh, cardamom, that would be the spice uh, of... Uh, uh, the original coffee back in the days, and now we drink it with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but how, who, when, where, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, figs, very important. Uh, as people jumped into Europe, uh, the fig became a very important source of food. Uh, the figs also started, or perhaps it started, uh, some of the early work in propagation because people were able to take a stick of a plant, shove it into the ground. They'll come back a few years later and realize, wow, there's a new tree here. So the process of cuttings, asexual propagation in plants, uh, did it start with a fig? Probably. Who was the person that shoved that stick in the ground and then later on came back and realized it grew into a tree? I, I wish I knew. Uh, but figs uh, commercially are propagated through that method. And uh, as they selected, they found uh, in individuals that have uh, more flesh uh, that were sweeter and much better tasting. Uh, and here's probably the best example. These are cardoons. Uh, and this is the ancestor of uh, artichokes. Artichokes, as we know them, do not exist in the wild. It is a man-made product. So artichokes started as a wild thistle somewhere in Europe. And uh, when they first started to cultivate them, they were cultivated for the leaf pedial. So what you see on the screen right now is known as cardoon. And cardoon is a very popular vegetable in uh, Italy. And so people started growing this wild artich, uh, thistle uh, for the leaf, for making some kind of dish. Eventually somebody decided to let it flower and maybe they uh, ran out of the leaves and uh, cut the flower head and then discovered, oh, this is kind of good. Uh, and eventually the artichoke was selected out of that. Uh, so they got bigger and bigger and bigger, and now California is one of the biggest producers of uh, artichokes in the world. Uh, but again, it is not never, nobody has ever found an artichoke in the wild. It is uh, a man-made product. Uh, so from Europe, uh, we can move into Asia where uh, the bean of preference is gonna be soybean. And the process of tofu, who came up with that? Uh, I know there's many traditional ways of processing, and now there's modern ways through machinery, but who was the first person that decided to ferment the beans and eventually process them into this uh, white tofu? Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, 
we don't know. And from there, how do you process it into soy milk? And now a hundred or a thousand and one products that are made with uh, soy. Uh, I don't know who was that, but I wish I would know. Uh, or there's also red beans that you may find uh, in uh, a lot of the desserts, a lot of the pastries, a lot of the uh, drinks. Uh, so that would be a red bean that also is high in vitamins and minerals and protein. And the grain of choice is going to be rice. And rice is a water grass. So somewhere, perhaps in a swampy area, there was this grass and somebody was brave enough or walking through the swamps, came across it, grabbed it, toasted it, cooked it, I don't know. Uh, but eventually it was domesticated and uh, now rice is uh, responsible for uh, feeding a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of different rice species out there and a couple of other uh, cultivated varieties, but I do not know who was trekking through the swamps. Uh, bitter melons, I mentioned before, all the melon families are, members of the member fa melon family are bitter. Uh, so bitter melon is a delicacy. Uh, you see it in the stores, people eat it because of the bitter taste to it. So over time, perhaps there was nothing better, uh, nothing was left to eat except bitter melon. So they had to, was it force themselves to eat it and eventually they liked it? I, I don't know, uh, but there's different kinds, there's different colors. Uh, there's some uh, that they refer to as uh, Indian bitter melon. Some are going to be Vietnamese, uh, different sizes uh, that are out there. Uh, and loofah. Uh, so loofah, it's often, often referred to as uh, Asian uh, asparagus uh, because uh, I guess you can eat them in the same way. So these are the loofahs when they are young. So you can eat them as a vegetable. Uh, and then who was a person that uh, also found the cucumbers? Uh, I'm gonna age myself and I'm gonna say that when I was young uh, and ate a cucumber, uh, the end was always thrown away because it became really bitter and really nasty tasting. Now you can eat a cucumber from beginning to end and it's sweet or whatever watery flavor it uh, has. So, and that is a uh, development in my lifetime, so I'm, but I'm not gonna age myself. Uh, but here's a lemon cucumber. There's the Persian cucumber, and all of those have been selected to be better tasting and not have any kind of bitterness associated with it. Uh, we have other cucumbers or melons here. Uh, and then going back to the loofah, uh, and uh, letting it dry out, become mature, either to harvest and eat the seeds, and later on for uh, using uh, the fibers as a cleaning agent for washing the body, for washing pots and everything else. Uh, who was the first person? I don't know. Uh, bananas. Uh, bananas are a horrible fruit because they have a little bit of meat and a lot of seeds. So if you were to take a bite into a banana, you would break your teeth. However, somewhere in nature, there was a natural hybrid that became sterile and it was still able to produce the fruit. So who was the person that was walking in the right direction, exploring the forest and came across this one banana that had big fruit without any seeds that was very sweet. Uh, I wish I knew. And then uh, how did the person know that if you dig up a tiny plant from the base and plant it over here, you would get the same banana that it has no seeds? I don't know. The fact of the matter is because banana is a sterile a hybrid you are eating exactly the same genetic banana as the first person who has ever discovered it. Uh, so very little work has been done with it. They have to now do some kind of genetic modification because bananas have been uh, not been able to multiply uh, 
uh, or genetically diversify themselves, but the diseases have, and now there is a serious threat of us losing bananas as we know, unless we do something uh, to uh, bring some resistance uh, to diseases. Uh, but we have the bananas uh, that have a lot of meat, but uh, no seeds. So all of these uh, bananas that you eat are going to be a human selection or human discovery, and including uh, the plantains, uh, the plantain bananas that are also referred to as cooking banana. So who bit it for the first time, got a serious stomach ache, and who was the first person to say, oh, let me fry it, uh, cook it, boil it, uh, to make it safe for me to eat. I don't know. And then the use of banana leaves. Uh, who was the first person to wrap something to cook it and create a tamale uh, or something else? Uh, I, I, I don't know. And uh, who was brave enough to eat the flour uh, of bananas? So was it nothing else? Then now you cut the flour because uh, otherwise uh, uh, you're going to starve and then you're going to chop it up, mix it with a couple of spices and kind of create a new dish and voila, you have a banana heart that is eaten in many parts of the world. Uh, I wish I knew. Uh, coconuts are going to also be very, very important. So the date palms are the tree of life for people that wanted to migrate out of Africa. Uh, the coconut became the tree of life for people who started to get on boats and explore the Polynesian islands and explore the islands off of uh, Asia. Uh, because they would get on their boats, they would travel for months, uh, and they will find, it, find an island or they will find an island. Islands in the tropics will be covered with coconuts. So when they got to the island, when they, get, when they got to the land, they had water inside in the form of uh, the coconut water and they have protein and carbohydrates and, uh, from the meat. And so it kept them alive. They will then uh, load up their boats with more coconuts because they would be uh, safe without any refrigeration for months and they will move on to the next island until they found uh, it and uh, restock with coconuts. So very, very, very valuable. Uh, we also have different types of millets and uh, the millets probably had a lot more value before some of the other crops uh, were introduced. Uh, but millets, uh, you can grind them up. They do have a lot of vitamins, minerals. And right now I think we use them more for feeding birds uh, than for feeding uh, humans. Uh, and then the true yams. Uh, these are found underneath the ground, and who was the first person to dig them out? Because it's a lot of work. Uh, so who said, oh, let's uh, look at this plant, let's dig underneath it, and uh, voila, let's find this uh, interesting thing that has a lot of calories and a lot of starch, and it's really good. Um, I don't know, uh, but yams are something that is eaten in almost every culture of the world. So wherever people went, they found whatever native yams were there and they were harvesting them many, many years ago. Uh, and taro. Taro as a plant is completely poisonous or toxic, the entire plant. Uh, it has oxalic acid, it has crystals. So if uh, somebody bites into the, the a taro leaf, uh, the crystals will uh, uh, stab the throat and uh, it will irritate the throat so much that we, it will close and people will die from suffocation because they're not going to be able to breathe. So who was the first person to realize that it was poisonous or who died? And after that person was on the ground, who was the next person to say, well, maybe if I cook it, it'll be safe, but let me try it. Uh, and then eventually they figured out how to remove uh, those toxic compounds either by cooking and later on by selection. Uh, but we know that taro leaves or uh, members of this family that are mostly poisonous have now been selected and they are used as a salad green or as a, a pot herb for different cultures. And we know that taro uh, 
uh, they refer to it as root, but it's a corm, it's not a root, taro stem. Uh, it has a lot of uh, starch and a lot of calories. So that was also very important for the Polynesians as they started sailing away from the mainland and into the different islands. Uh, but taro in the past was toxic and now it is safe to eat. Uh, sugar cane. Who found it? Here is a gigantic grass that uh, it's from Asia. Uh, but who was the first person to come across it and uh, take a bite out of it and realize, oh, this is really sweet. And then who was the first person to take the juice and somehow get them to crystallize where you will then get what is known or what was known uh, during the time as sweet salt. So when sugar was introduced to Europe, it was not referred to as sugar. Uh, it was referred to as sweet salt because people knew salt, uh, but they had no idea what sugar was. And so we know that sugar was very popular. We know that humans like sugar. That's why all those candies and cookies and sweets are so difficult to give up because our brain loves sugar and we want sugar and we like sugar. Uh, and it changed everything because now uh, before the creation of sugar, people would only eat something sweet if they were brave enough to fight the bees and steal their honey or uh, be bummed. Uh, or through some of the sweetness of the fruits that were available at the time, but the sweets, uh, the fruits from those times was nowhere as near as sweet as the ones we have now. Uh, so we got the sugar canes that at some point somebody had to squeeze out uh, the juice. I don't know what equipment, I know if there are special meals, uh, and then create uh, the sugar. And then uh, if we come to the Americas, uh, how did it all start? Uh, could it be something like this that you find in Peru? Uh, so it is believed that this is how the Andinians uh, started to select the plants that would become hardy enough to survive the higher altitudes of the Andes mountain. So it is written somewhere that people were collecting seeds from wherever they found them. And then they created this uh, structures. And uh, what happened is that those wild seeds that were harvested from the wild, from wherever, uh, they were planted at the bottom. Uh, the bottom was protected. So the temperature, the difference between the, the temperature at each level can be noticed. Uh, by walking or climbing up. So the bottom area tend to be the warmest because the uh, cold air is gonna uh, kind of stay away. So the plants that were very tender uh, were able to survive uh, for the season here and they were able to produce seeds. Uh, it is said that they, those seeds were harvested from the individuals that were able to tolerate this temperature at the bottom. And those seeds were planted in the next level above, which is a little bit colder. The same process will be repeated where whatever seed germinated, survived, gave the seeds, those were harvested and they were planted above. And they, through different steps in several years, eventually were able to take the seeds and make them uh, make those plants able to survive the very cold temperature of the top of the mountains. Uh, they say that this was a storage area and that is where the seeds were held or kept or stored as they were experimenting. Uh, but there are many, many of this type of architectural sites in uh, Peru. And uh, they're saying they were very good agriculturists, uh, which they were. Uh, and this is how they believe uh, they were able to select a lot of the foods that they're eating right now. Uh, so here's a, a different view uh, of uh, how they uh, look. Uh, or here's a, actually no, uh, yeah. Uh, here's a different view from a different angle for the first one that I showed. Uh, 
uh, showed you. So, uh, or was it uh, the Machu Picchu? Perhaps some of those uh, terracing that we know that people were able to harvest and uh, grow food in mountains because they were able to terrace. Uh, they could change uh, their environment to make their plants survive. Uh, and so was it um, perhaps maybe through some of this terracing where uh, the seeds were then uh, harvested or cultivated and mass produced? Uh, we don't know, uh, but it is believed that the indigenous in Machu Picchu were able to produce uh, their own food on top of the mountains. Uh, but from the Americas, we have uh, some of the beans, uh, the beans that now have become the staple of uh, many cultures. So most of the beans that people will eat, except for the red bean and the uh, soybean, will come from the Americas. Uh, uh, red beans, pinto beans, kidney beans, uh, white beans, Peruvian beans, uh, all of those are the Americans. And or the grain of choice is going to be corn. Now there's debate where corn may have originated. Uh, some say that it may be from South America. Some say that it's going to be from Mexico. Uh, they're finding new uh, architectural sites that may be changing everything. So somewhere in the Americas, somebody discovered uh, a plant, a wild grass, and that became the corn. Uh, the original corn was something like this. So in Mexico, there is a plant by the name of Teocintle, which is a very old wild corn. So the cob was nothing more than just a couple of uh, grains. Uh, the grains will then shatter and explode, and that's how the plant will uh, multiply and spread their seeds. So shattering, uh, shattering or removing uh, that uh, capability of the plant it was something that in modern day corn was removed to make it easy for us. Uh, and uh, then we have the silks with the grains that are now much, much bigger, more calories, uh, more vitamins, more minerals. And then in Mexico, there is the process of liming coal, uh, corn. So lime as in uh, the mineral, gypsum, uh, cal in Spanish, and so this is where I have another question. So you harvest the grain for the year that is going to sustain you for the rest of the season. And who was the person that decided to boil some water with corn and add this white powder to it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but the liming process does create a very, very good thing. So after you boil or after the corn is boiled with lime, uh, then you get what is known as nistamal, which is a much, much more um, uh, or a richer uh, corn that has more vitamins, minerals, and more calcium than if you were to eat it by itself. Uh, but it also changed the chemistry uh, of uh, the masa. So now here's the, this is tamal, let's grind it up. We're gonna have this mush or masa uh, that we can work with it. Uh, the liming process changes the chemistry of the masa and makes it very, very, very sticky. And uh, the fact that it becomes very sticky, it made it possible for uh, Mexicans to develop what is known as the very thin tortilla. So that is why tortillas, the thin one, is only a Mexican thing because only Mexicans use uh, or have traditionally used uh, the liming process. In Central America, they have uh, pupusas or something thicker because they don't use lime. And in uh, South America, it's the same thing. But for many, many years, uh, it was known that people would trade that lime and they would go distance, travel distance to find it because it was essential for them for making tortillas that are gonna be very, very thin. Uh, and then the squash, the pumpkins uh, that also come from America, once again, bitter in the beginning, uh, but the pitas, the pumpkin seeds, very nutritious, very good tasting. So originally probably harvested for that and eventually selecting some of the pumpkins to be sweeter or palatable, then gave us the modern day pumpkins that we have right now. Uh, we have some other American uh, pumpkin, chilacayote, 
that in certain cultures, they use it for making candy, making drinks, and a bunch of other things. Also heard that the seeds are very, very good. Uh, or chayote, uh, another wild squash that was growing on some vine and somebody harvested and voila, uh, just boil it with a little bit of salt and it's very good or add it to some kind of dish and it's great. Or uh, manejar or yuca. And this is another one, just like taro, every single portion of the plant is poisonous. It even has white milk. Uh, and so who was the person who died? Uh, we know that propagation for this is going to be through direct sticks. So they cut the sticks from the plant and shove them in the ground. And in a matter of two months, uh, you can harvest a very, very large root that is going to have a lot of starch. So the amount of starch, the amount of calories that you can get out of a single plant is very high compared to some other plants. So once they harvested the roots, how do you make them safe? Uh, so in the beginning, they would scrape uh, the yucca they would then uh, put it in a burlap bag or a, some kind of cloth and they'll hang it. Uh, they'll hang it to allow gravity to leach out the juices, leaving behind only a bunch of starch that was then safe to eat. Uh, so that's the beginning. And then uh, later on, as they started to select uh, plants that were less toxic, they would then start to cook it. Uh, the yucca and the cooking process would remove whatever uh, toxins were still present. And that's what we have here, just boiled yucca. Uh, and then eventually you take the starch and you can make some kind of bread. Uh, we know that yucca from the America became very, very important source of food in tropical countries of the world. So tropical Africa, tropical Asia, they use a lot of yucca and uh, also they're still being used in a America as well. And uh, potatoes, how did it get to where it is? So here's possibly how potato looked in the past. So here's from Peru, some wild nightshade that was found just in between the crevices, in between the rocks. Uh, and then somebody decided, oh, let me dig it up and uh, discovered that it had tiny, tiny uh, little balls on the, below the ground and uh, they decided to cook them and decided to eat them. So perhaps from this very low growing wild potato plant, then eventually the more modern day potato uh, plant arose that now becomes uh, a lot bigger. And then uh, we have some of the common potatoes that you're going to find uh, around here at your local market. Uh, and some of the fufu potatoes that are becoming a lot more popular. But to really see potatoes, you have to travel to Peru, where they have varieties of potatoes that you're never going to find here. And they're much better tasting. Some of them are going to be sweet uh, and uh, not as starchy and a lot of different varieties. So it is known that potato came from somewhere in the Andinian mountains and uh, domestication and eventually different selections arose and you have all these different potatoes that you are never going to see here. And the same thing with uh, pepper. Peppers are poisonous. Uh, the thing that burns when you eat it is the poison that is not supposed to uh, make you eat it. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, cut some peppers and rub your eyes. It is very, very uncomfortable. However, we have now learned to like that toxin and like the spiciness and add some more to the point where the people who are taking those pepperhead challenges are now abusing their body because some of those have become really, really uh, strong. Uh, but it was toxic. It is the toxic that is in the plant that we now seek out to make our food taste better or to brag that we ate a ghost pepper or a Carolina, Carolina Ripper or any of those other uh, peppers that are out there. Uh, or some of the other ones that are less spicy that are used for flavoring and for making food uh, taste good. 
so how? I, I, I don't know who was the first person to be brave enough to buy that. Uh, cacao, chocolate, uh, as mentioned with a previous plant, uh, was not grown for the seeds in the beginning. So these are, are the cacao seeds that have the coating of a very soft, fleshy, sweet pulp. So in the beginning, people would probably just take the seeds, shove them in their mouth, uh, scrape away the pulp with their teeth and probably spit out the seeds. Uh, later on, they figured that if they would to roast them and process them, they could make some kind of drink. Uh, so here's a seed when you remove uh, the pulp uh, from it. And, and pineapples perhaps started as a baby pineapple at one point or another. Pineapple as we know it is also completely sterile. You are not gonna find any viable seeds in them. Uh, they're another man-made product, uh, but in South America, uh, there are some wild pineapples, nowhere near as big as what we have uh, here uh, for eating. Uh, so here's a baby pineapple, and uh, also in Central and South America, you have other uh, variety selections of pineapple that are way better than anything you're going to find here in uh, America. And uh, a bean that was very popular in South America was uh, peanuts. So peanuts uh, come originate from Argentina. So peanuts or ground nuts, uh, as they are often referred to, uh, very important. They were discovered. George Washington Carver is uh, the person that decided to experiment with peanuts and he found many, many ways of using them, processed them, and eventually made it peanuts as uh, popular as they are right now. Uh, peanuts feed the world, so a lot of countries uh, eat peanut on a regular basis as part of a regular diet, not just uh, during sports events like Americans do. Uh, but peanuts are very important and they're good and they're also very, uh, good uh, in vitamins and minerals and all of that. Uh, and then the, the cabbages or the common vegetables that we have uh, probably started as some kind of kale-like, uh, just a leafy green that was harvested that people maybe seek out uh, those uh, sulfur compounds because of that whatever taste. Uh, but eventually we have some kind of kale-like uh, purple kale and then eventually a smaller one was selected for having dwarf lateral buds that became uh, the Brussels sprouts. And then eventually a plant that was very, very dwarf and compact became what we know as uh, the ca uh, cabbage head or the red cabbage head or something like that. So probably from some leafy green, uh, people develop uh, the, uh, the, the cabbage. And then radish, here's wild radish. It grows out there. Uh, in the beginning, people were not eating the root, they were eating the fruit. So the fruit, when you take a bite at it and it's green, uh, it tastes exactly like a radish. Uh, so that was the beginning. Uh, then uh, I was taken into Europe. Uh, they started to select some of the button radishes because they were kind of cutesy and then eventually uh, more came out. Uh, but we have a lot of different selections of radishes. So here is the Korean radish. Uh, here's a daikon radish and uh, people don't really eat radishes around here. There's much, much better tasting and they should be eaten more by people. Uh, and the eggplant. Eggplant uh, in the beginning were probably green uh, like you see right now, that is the Cambodian ape eggplant. Uh, and then during the Victorian period, a selection that was pure white was developed. And that's why they call eggplant because it was a si size and shape of an egg and it was white. Uh, but eventually the different forms were selected, uh, such as the Asian eggplant or the Italian eggplant or some of the Indian eggplants that you see right there. So probably from a tiny eggplant that looked like this, uh, the other ones were eventually selected. Uh, a lot of the plants that 
we used to rely upon in the past and were replaced by something better are still out there. And those are the ones that we refer to as weeds. So here in this photograph uh, back of our campus, we have a lot of wild oats. It's edible, you can harvest a grain. And in the past, it was a cultivated crop, but as soon as the modern day oat was developed, this one went in, out of popularity and it's growing in the fields. It's just making a living somewhere else. Uh, and it's still with us, uh, but we no longer consider it an agricultural com commodity. We don't no longer consider it important. Uh, so we no longer harvest it and or grow it. But because it is related to oats, it is related to all the grasses and they have the same current culture, you'll find that they're gonna try to grow in areas that people have uh, disturbed and where there might be some moisture and humidity. And because they're competing with the plants that we want, uh, we're gonna call them weeds and we're gonna call them unwanted plants. So the weeds begin to follow people very, very early on because those are plants that people selected that can no longer go back to the wild and uh, wherever there's a human disturbance they're going to follow people and so with all of these discoveries all of these plants uh, it got us to where we are today so civilization developed so from hunting, hunting and gathering we figure out how to cultivate select cultivate and grow a lot of food and then it became unnecessary for people to move around. Uh, so then we started to get some of the villages uh, and increase the number of people that were able to sustain. And uh, eventually technology took over, uh, more permanent structures were built. Uh, then we have some towns and areas that we can now clear to bring the plants, our food closer to us. Uh, and then eventually the cities as we know them uh, develop and that is where we are right now. So all because some brave human back in the days was brave enough to eat something and figure out how to make it palatable and good for us. Uh, the plant exchange was also occurring very early. People were moving plants around because they knew what they were eating or they could eat. And so they would bring them with them at least until they would finish them. Uh, but later on in plant explorations, plants move around. Uh, you find plants from different parts of the world here in California, as well as California plants in other parts of the world. Uh, so then that became necessary to have nurseries where now we can cultivate uh, all these domesticated plants, grow them in a container to make them easy to move around and or make them easy to be planted somewhere in the field. So then the nursery business industry uh, became very important. Uh, we are at a turning point where the modern day GMO, the modern name biotechnology is promising uh, and we are gonna, gonna, not gonna be 100% against it. Uh, we have to look at two different views. As an agriculture person, I, I tend to like it. Uh, don't think it's bad, but neither were the atomic bomb and nuclear uh, energy in the beginning. It was later made into something wicked and something ugly. Uh, so perhaps it might be the way to go in the future because as the plants that were uh, over 4,000 years old, uh, they have been selected to not produce more or maybe changing our agricultural ways, maybe being wiser. I and mean, there could be a couple more ways that we can continue to improve and enhance and grow more food. Maybe we shouldn't throw away so much. Uh, and uh, continue on processing and discovering things uh, and uh, making things palatable and edible and good for us. So with this uh, slide, I will answer if anybody has a question. Does anybody have a question? You have a question, just unmute yourself and start talking. If you don't have a question, then uh, just uh, leave the meeting and I will see you all on Tuesday and you can have a great weekend. I'm gonna stop the recording so I don't make it too long.